you are listening to a Crew Plus Academy webinar. Today is World Water Day and um, this webinar is being simultaneously translated into Spanish. There's also a Spanish channel um, and I can put the link to the Spanish channel in this chat um, if you wish to switch languages. So, um, welcome again everybody. I will introduce to you the speakers now. I hope you can see my screen, see myself and hear me well. If you don't or you have any questions, technical problems, troubles, just post everything into the chat box. Otherwise, I must kindly ask you to remain silent, uh, mute yourselves and have the cameras off. Uh, and I invite the speakers only to turn the cameras on when they are speaking and later also when we will have the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Now let's see if this works. Yes, it does. Perfect. So um, these are the speakers, uh, the experts today of today's webinar. Let me start by introducing to you Ms. Elaine Cheung. Elaine has worked on climate mitigation in water and wastewater utilities since 2017 at GIZ. She is currently supervising the development of a greenhouse gas assessment tool for utilities to enable them to report on water related NDCs, nationally determined commitments, if I am not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong, Elaine. And um, she works at the GIZ. Sorry? Contributions. Contribution. There we go. Thanks. Um, and she works at the GIZ program VACLIM. Um, which is short for, we will see on the next slide. Um, we move on to our next presenter, who is Alex Moroner. He is the Network uh, Director at the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, in short version AGVA, uh, which is an international NGO focused on developing and mainstreaming climate resilient water management in policy and in practice. Alex helps to coordinate programs across AGVA's uh, global network of water and climate professionals. And he is also the host of the Climate Ready podcast. So, Alex, if you want to uh, promote your podcast, you can also just share a link uh, to your podcast in the chat box right here. That would be great. Moving on to our next guest, um, we are honored to have on board Ignatius Jean. He is the executive director at the Caribbean Water and Sewerage Association, in short, CAWASA, since 2014. CAWASA um, has a mission and it is to provide for the sustainable growth and development of water utilities and the promotion of water and water related issues through delivery of quality training and utilizing collective resources and experiences. And we are thrilled to hear more about Kawasa's work later on. Last but not least, we have Martin Keres, um, who also works as Elaine in the same project and uh, GIZ Vaklim. He has worked on water and climate resilience for more than 10 years. He's a resilience dinosaur. Um, and he has worked at the Inter-American Development Bank in the Climate Change and Sustainability Division from 2012 to 2015. So thank you all again for joining and thanks to the great panel of experts we have here. I will just briefly talk you through the agenda. Um, so the first thing we have already done, we have introduced the speakers. Then uh, we will have Elaine who will set the scene um, to get us into the mood for the topic today. And then we will have um, Alex who is going to talk about climate resilience for wastewater infrastructure. We will have afterwards the perspective from the Utilities Association by Ignatius. And then uh, I think it is time for all of us to have a five minute break. And uh, during the break, I will kindly ask you to fill in a survey how much you are loving this webinar. This is very helpful for us in terms of feedback. And uh, after the break, we will hear from Martin about climate risk management at the Vaclin program. And then we will go into a panel discussion, which is not just with Ignatius, but with everyone actually. And we invite you, the audience, to type questions into the chat box so we can engage together 
um, and have a joint discussion. So I am handing over to Elaine now. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Alice. So I'm in charge of setting the scene. Um, as we all know, and this might also be the reason why you are all here is that there is a pressing need to take action against climate change and water and wastewater utilities are expected to become increasingly susceptible to the expected impacts of climate change and these impacts will materialize with more frequent or more severe extreme events including floods or droughts, different rainfall patterns and temperatures as well as seasonal shifts. Especially in this region, speaking about the Caribbean and Latin America is prone to climate change impacts. However, many stakeholders, managers and investors do not yet fully consider future climate conditions as necessary input to business risk analysis and long-term planning. Yet it is critical to adequately consider climate risks and opportunities when planning for water and wastewater services and water resources in general. So as mentioned before, I personally work on climate mitigation in water and wastewater utilities, meaning to reduce greenhouse gas emissions along the urban water cycle from abstraction, treatment and distribution over to collection, treatment and discharge. And becoming climate smart comes with many benefits for utilities, since it is possible to implement low carbon measures while improving service levels and efficiencies. Nevertheless, Mitigation and climate resilience have to go together. They have to be thought together. So resilience is more than just implementing the right technology or practice to assess and address risks of extreme events. Considering climate risks is likely to improve the service provider's resilience and result in increased reliability and operational effectiveness in both the short and the long term. Water and wastewater utilities need to be willing to engage in long-term planning that accounts for the deep uncertainties they face, and it will also continue to impact service provision in the future. And this, at the end, may directly benefit the local economy, national resource security, and also national economic growth. So I'm looking very much forward to the inputs to the, of the other speakers. And with these words, I wish you all a happy World Water Day and I hand back over to Alicia. Thank you. Great, Elaine. Thank you so much uh, for setting the scene so wonderfully. We have learned uh, from you really about the importance of uh, long-term planning and of being climate smart. Thank you so much. And so without further ado, I would hand over to Alex now. Um, here you go. And I will share your presentation. So just say next. Excellent. Next slide. Thanks. Thanks, Alita. Hello, everyone. Uh, you could go ahead and um, skip on to the title slide, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be part of this event on World Water Day and really looking forward to the presentations and discussions uh, after my own. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, my name is Alex Maroner. I'm the network director for an organization called AGWA, or the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. I'm joining you today from the state of Arkansas in the southeast US, where we're experiencing some beautiful spring weather here. And today in my short talk, I'm going to try and focus on what climate resilience might look like for wastewater utilities, identifying some of the principles of resilience, what changes need to be made to achieve resilience, and what are some of the tools and approaches uh, that can help to get you there. Next slide, please. As a really quick introduction, uh, I mentioned that I'm here representing AGWA, uh, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. We're a members-based network uh, that works globally through a mix of technical and policy programs, developing and crowdsourcing and mainstreaming approaches to address climate risk for water resource management. We're also really involved in integrating water more deeply 
uh, and embedding it in climate policy discussions and negotiation, primarily processes involving the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change or the UNFCCC, including uh, COP26 later this year. Uh, our 2,000 plus members uh, represent a large range of disciplines and, and categories of institutions, academia, development banks, uh, finance, ecology, um, NGOs, all sorts of, of people. And, and most of our work really takes a similar cross-sectoral approach uh, to the perspective of climate adaptation and climate mitigation. Next slide, please. And a lot of what my uh, work is with Agua is about addressing uncertainty in water management. When we talk about how climate change is impacting our lives and our work, we're often talking about extreme events like floods, droughts, sea level rise. Um, another huge threat though uh, from climate change that's less often uh, explicitly discussed is about working with uncertainty and deep uncertainty as Elaine mentioned there at the intro. Our infrastructure is designed to last decades and sometimes even centuries. We need to think about sustainability over similarly long periods. That will directly impact the way that we not only design uh, and plan things like wastewater infrastructure, but how we manage and operate and update systems as conditions change. And as we're beginning to think beyond like 10 and 20 years, we have to think of climate change as one of the primary drivers that we're facing. That requires a big change from the way that we traditionally manage water resources. Not only do our systems need to meet basic engineering performance needs, they need to be able to continue to do so even in a future when climate and other uncertainties like economic changes, demographic shifts, uh, and new stresses and changing conditions. So how do we reach our destination when obstacles keep popping up along the way that we couldn't foresee? Next slide, please. So as we begin to shift the way that we're thinking about infrastructure, we often hear we need to build in resilience, but we don't often get into the finer details of what that really means. Resilience has become sort of a buzzword over the last few years. And in today's discussions, I think we're going to hear some of the ways that the idea is being put into practice and operationalized in the context of wastewater infrastructure in the LAC region in particular, uh, with great talks upcoming from Ignatius and from Martin. And for me, at least, I'd like to start by giving you my definition of resilience and the one that we often use within my organization. And it boils down to this, that resilience is a combination of robustness and flexibility. Water resilience is typically implemented through robustness, meaning planning and designing for a range of credible climatic futures, uh, flexibility, which is the ability to avoid climate-related traps, uh, and path dependencies, or maybe a combination of these two strategies of robustness and flexibility. Um, and another emerging concept is, is the idea to come up with layered multi-solution approaches, which is a concept that we like to call deep resilience within Agua. If COVID-19 and the global crisis has taught us anything, it's that many of our systems are deeply connected. You know, we can think about supply chain disruptions during the pandemic. And that means whenever possible, we can strive towards deep resilience when we're considering complicated relationships that impact our water management. Simply put, that could mean looking at upstream, downstream linkages, uh, or it could be taking something like a basin scale perspective, uh, even for an individual small scale facilities level project. Uh, next slide, please. And so moving beyond theory, what does climate resilience look like for water infrastructure? Well, really it involves a number of changes across the project life cycle. One of the main ones that I'll focus on is changing the way that we assess risk. Instead of traditionally trying to predict what climate futures might look like and coming up with solutions that fit those predictions, we could take a performance-based approach, meaning that we begin to assess risk by identifying some key performance metrics that we want to maintain so for wastewater systems, that could mean something like the volume of wastewater treated or the cost per unit volume. And climate resilience also means taking a more holistic view of the system and coming up with uh, shared visions of success with other groups that are involved. So a really stakeholder-driven process from the outset. 
that could include water consumers and the general public, local government officials, and even environmental groups. And with input from these stakeholder groups, often uh, as the byproduct of a workshop or some similar scoping exercise, water managers and decision makers can try to come to a consensus of what a shared vision of success might look like from a performance perspective. From there, um, we can do things like conduct a vulnerability analysis or a stress test to see how different climate changes and management changes would impact the system performance and those, those performance metrics that you're really interested. Um, we can come up with a wide range of options uh, to consider when we're doing these stress tests. You'll get a lot of data and outputs um, of the system uh, whenever you do these stress tests, and you'll be able to make better informed decisions about different decision about different water management choices and, and design and planning options based on your tolerance of risk, uh, their costs, and other factors that are important to your decision. Sometimes an expensive project may be more efficient, but the funding might not be available for those interventions. So it's important to look at a range of possible uh, design and management options. And, and what we can really do, which I'll talk about some of the frameworks in a minute, is is come up with approaches to assess and compare trade-offs around efficacy or cost when you're comparing these different options. Um, and there are a number of different tools out there to do so. And the idea or the goal is that you can, um, instead of being abstract or theoretical, you can quantifiably examine trade-offs between different infrastructure choices, between different management options. Um, and some of those options might even be nature-based solutions, uh, green solutions, or green gray hybrid options, uh, and so on. Next slide, please. So as you're looking at different stressors to the system, as you're trying to build resilience and you're running a vulnerability analysis or a stress test to compare different options, it's, it's important to note which of the solutions out there might be able to provide multiple benefits. As I mentioned earlier, something around deep resilience and trying to really maximize um, the bang for your buck when a lot of times we're working with limited resources. So a lot of times in traditional water management, a system is designed uh, really well to meet one or two basic criteria, uh, and it does so and functions well in, in a very narrow range of climate conditions. Resilient solutions, however, they should function across a wide range of uh, possible climate futures and operating conditions. They should also be multi-purpose in order to maximize, again, cost effectiveness, build in redundancies and, and meet multiple um, definitions of success. However, not all objectives uh, have the same level of importance and sometimes they have different climate sensitivities and different uh, objectives as well. So it's a complex process uh, examining these trade-offs, um, but something that's still beneficial as an exercise. And along these lines, uh, adaptation should be embedded in the process from the beginning of a project, even when you're talking about maybe Reoperationalizing an existing infrastructure asset, you try to build in um, adaptive capacity uh, monitoring processes so that you can be flexible over time as conditions change because climate resilience is really a process and not a one and done action. Next slide, please. And I wanted to close by mentioning a few specific approaches and resources that can help you to operationalize resilience. And one of them is called CRIDA or Climate Risk Informed Decision Analysis. It's a stepwise methodology. It was published as a guidebook from uh, UNESCO and the UNESCO Center in the US called IC Warm just a few years ago in 2018. Um, and it's a process and approach to help water managers to make, uh, to assess risks and impacts and to develop resilient strategies. It's applicable to a range of contexts from um, scale-wise, from city scale all the way up to basin or it's had transboundary applications and for a lot of different water resource management um, situations such as wastewater treatment, uh, even things like flood management and, and drought prevention, um, irrigation projects, etc. I won't ask you to read through the fine print of this uh, figure on the left here, but basically the, pri the CRIDA process comes down to uh, at the beginning a participatory scoping uh, exercise and coming up with um, defining performance metrics with other stakeholders. You then model the system and you identify some of the vulnerabilities to those performance metrics through the process of stress testing. You model some different management actions uh, and design options um, that can reduce vulnerabilities to performance 
and you're considering the effectiveness, the feasibility, the cost. Um, and then once you have this range of options, you try to design an adaptation plan so you can um, be effective over time as conditions change. You implement it, you monitor the process. Uh, it's important to note that, that all of these approaches are iterative. Uh, you can continue to look at different management options in the future as conditions change. Uh, you can rerun the analysis. And again, this is a, a process, not a one and done action. And to the next slide, please. So that was real quickly about an approach called CRIDA, but CRIDA is by no means the only approach to climate risk assessment that may be uh, useful or of interest to you. It's part of a, a family of what's known as bottom-up approaches to assessing and addressing climate risk. They share a lot of the same principles. Um, they've been developed over the last decade or so and are really emerging globally and being institutionalized um, through different governments and management agencies. Um, and there's really a strong evidence base building for all of these too. Uh, so you can look at the link that's at the bottom right of this um, and find out a lot more case studies and resources. Uh, but just quickly, a few of the other options out there. Uh, the World Bank published its decision tree framework, I think in 2015. Um, this is a process to evaluate or justify uh, water management investments, um, a process that came out of the Netherlands known as Adaptation Pathways, really emphasizes flexibility and risk minimization to building climate resilience um, so that you're taking a dynamic approach to planning. Uh, it allows for policies to change over a project's lifetime. And decision scaling, uh, last but not least, is maybe the original of these approaches. Um, created as part of a transboundary project between the US and Canada in 2010 called the Upper Great Lakes Study. And again, this is an approach um, for building climate robustness uh, that looks at reducing risk through a number of different uh, design modifications for water infrastructure. Uh, again, you can find information about all of these, uh, including the guidebooks themselves, if you're interested at the link listed at the bottom. And next slide, please. And with that, I'll go ahead and close. And thank you so much for your time and attention. And I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Alex. We have already learned a lot um, about, for instance, how Agua strives uh, for deep resilience, what resilience actually, uh, how it can be defined. And um, also that climate resilience is a process, as you have mentioned, which is a good statement. And uh, yeah, thank you also for presenting uh, one of the family members of the bottom-up approaches uh, for decision taking. So um, I will now gladly hand over to our next speaker, who is Ignatius. Um, you are on. Oh, ah, yeah, I can see you. You're right there. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. Um, do you want the video as well? Uh, it would be great if we can uh, I, I'm see trying you. To, I'm trying to turn on my camera, but it seems <laughs> not coming on. <laughs> okay, um, good morning everyone, and uh, let me wish everyone a happy World Water Day. And also for us to remember the true value of water, and particularly to value the men and women who make water run to our homes and offices, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I am uh, the executive director of the Caribbean Water and Sewage Association. Uh, you can begin sharing my first screen. Uh, yeah. All right. For some reason, your the video is not giving me access. Um, yes, so I'm Ignatia Jha, the Executive Director at the Caribbean Water and Sewage Association. Uh, the next slide. We, we are an association of water utilities, of course, implicitly. Um, we are also responsible for, most of the utilities also are responsible for sewage in the, in the countries. Um, we do principally our principal mandate is that of staff training and development. Uh, we offer a certification program that is al aligned to the ABC certification um, 
courses in the USA. Um, we do lots of networking with our utilities and other external agencies to try to, you know, do the linkages so that we can add value to what we're doing with the people in our water sector. And institutional strengthening, including doing the working with the utilities to build their human resource capacities and infrastructural capacities. Next slide, please. So that I am showing you, of course, I'm I'm on this call from St. Lucia, where Kawasa is headquarters, the Caribbean Water and Sewage Association. And we are showing off this slide, which most people, when we speak of the Caribbean region, we think of this ideal idyllic setting of water utilities of the Caribbean, where people come for vacations and die queries on the beach, etc. But there is a flip side to all of that good life, which you probably will get for most of the year, particularly six good months of the year. But as you get into the other half of the year, into the next slide, uh, you will see how the other reality that we face is that we are in one of the most um, regions most prone to natural disasters. And we have had, according to the National o Oceanic Agency of the United States, um, some of the tracking of hurricanes up to 2016, and we didn't even show um, some of the more recent years in there. And this is what, that's, that's the other reality in the Caribbean. And of course, we are prone to climate hazards, and we have a history of being adversely impacted by weather-related events, resulting in significant losses and damage. Uh, most of the Caribbean islands lie within the North Atlantic hurricane belt. And with major climatic events affecting our region, including tropical depression, cyclones, which generate strong winds, rainstorms that cause flooding, landslides, and storm surges. Um, the, the climate change poses significant physical risk to the Caribbean region. Um, by the exacerbating the island's existing vulnerabilities. And of course, we are not only prone to those risks, we are also, um, because the way our economies are structured, uh, we face a lot of other external um, uh, um, um, hazards and, and, and risks because we are highly dependent on a lot of external activity and we are vulnerable to lots of commodity shocks and um, we have endured prolonged episodes of uncertainty in our economic activities um, particularly in in the last year what has happened with COVID-19. Uh, the next slide please. So it, it, if we are still the fact that we are still around in the region says a lot about us that we have not just packed up and, and run to other shores. We have remained and we continue to build and we continue to live. So there's a degree of resiliency in, in our utilities and the people in the region. Of course, we are also um, have a, other factors that affect us, and not only just the hurricanes and, and floods and rainstorms, but that we are being um, one of the a UN report recently had indicated that our, the Caribbean region accounts for, for seven of the world's top 36 water stress countries. And that includes um, islands such as Barbados and St. Kitts and Nevis, Antigua and Barbuda, um, Jamaica, um, you know, are classified in, in that category. And we are already experiencing increases in the frequency of of severe storms and um, in the mo last five years we have seen an increase in the number of category five hurricanes which are totally devastating um, to our countries and, and our utilities. And of course we have had some prolonged droughts um, say the period 2010-2015 and some of the islands that depend on uh, water resources from groundwater um, have not had the levels of rainfall to replenish their, their aquifers, and that poses another threat. 
Next slide, please. So these are just some of the examples. Um, as you rebuild, um, the recovery process is difficult. And like in Dominica in 2015, uh, it was just a tropical depression at the time. It became a, a tropical storm and caused tremendous destruction in the island of Dominica. In 2010, there was Hurricane Thomas in, in St. Lucia in the next slide, um, which um, devastated um, one of the major um, water catchments on the island of St. Lucia. Um, being the John Compton Dam in the in the mountains, and maybe about 80 percent, well, 60 percent of the population were, would have been without water from that source for a considerable period. And in fact, as we speak, there is work on going to dredge that facility to restore its capacity where it had lost some two thirds of its storage capacity. Uh, the other challenge that is faced there in terms of vulnerability in the next slide you will see is the issue of those islands that depend on uh, surface water, um, the issue of high stability because of heavy rainfall and intense rainfall where we have quite a bit of erosion and um, the soil is carried away and all the siltation increases the turbidity. So it increases the cost for utilities to produce water. Now, then there is in the next slide, you will find that um, we, again, because we are, an, we are islands on the, uh, a lot of the infrastructure would be running along the coastlines as best as possible. They would try to get it away from the coastlines, but there are some territories that are, are so flat that there is not much of a choice that you will have with sea surges and sea level rise there will be it will affect um, the, the the infrastructure and that could be a, very expensive to the utilities now some of what the actions that have been taken um, in the caribbean region with support from the caribbean development bank as we go into the next slide uh, you will find that there was a study commissioned by the Caribbean Development Bank um, with uh, H.R. Wallingford uh, to help the countries in, in um, the utilities in particular in establishing vulnerability risk assessments. And the, one of the things that was done is uh, mapping out a sort of risk um, index, a climate risk index um, for, for the region based on um, water stress levels and uh, modeling against um, the, the non-revenue water that obtained in these countries and, and some other factors. So this is just part of that work which I wanted to highlight that there is work as we speak that has been ongoing and many of the utilities have undertaken those vulnerability risk assessments and it's based on the, the three water risk pillars. Of course, you will you will find that we we speak have been speaking about water and we speaking about wastewater, but implicitly and in, invariably there is work that must be um, it is related to to wastewater as well because once you produce um, you know one drop of water you will also have wastewater. Um, next slide. And so, as I mentioned, there's the the water risk three pillars as a, as a guide. To in, in a manual that was prepared by um, the CDB or for the CDB for the utilities and the, the training programs that followed so that they could have undertaken the vulnerability risk assessment. Now, in the next slide, you will find that aspect on the coverage of sewage um, in, in the Caribbean region. And the island where you would find the most coverage is in Trinidad, where you have some 30% um, coverage. But most of the other, ter and, and Jamaica at 20%, um, in, in Belize it's about 17%, and as you go down the island chain, um, it's less. Um, the challenge, it is most of the utilities, except for some of the urban areas or in the cities, you will have some bit of coverage. 
of of sewage but this is not many of the islands depend heavily on septic tanks and other um, forms of disposal there are not many treatment facilities except um, again in a, where those exist so you would have a lot of raw sewage or untreated sewage disposed into our coastal areas um, and that is one of the quiet um, things or uh, factors that is affecting our environment in the region and many of the utilities are seeking to redress that but of course a lot of the, the um, priorities have been to try to get water coverage to as many people as possible and oftentimes the aspect of treating with the environmental impact of the disposal of wastewater um, is not given the, the requisite level of attention and support um, financially so that you will find in many of the countries they they still it's a big issue to to deal with and we have been looking at other aspects of of managing um, the challenges of managing wastewater um, we go to the next slide please so about 90 percent of the households and farms depend on on-site septic tanks um, and there are challenges with data availability. Um, there are issues with land land use. So you have urban sprawl in areas that increasingly are being urbanized with residential and other commercial developments. And that too would have impacts on on um, you know disposal of of sewage. Many of the the hotel plants that are being um, developed in in more recent time they also have been using um, packaged treatment facilities and of course there may not be in all of these cases the requisite training of the operators uh, for um, these um, packaged sewage treatment plants but many of those who where they are functioning um, the, the water is also, there's an element of reuse for irrigation. So it requires a high level of investment um, for households and in the private sector, et cetera. And one of the things that you, you, we have too is that with so, um, septic tanks, there is not adequate, um, I suppose, education of the public and private sector about you know the the maintenance and for collection of the the sludge etc after a period of time so this is work that must be ongoing um in the in the next slide i i just wanted to make the point because we are heavily dependent dependent on tourism in these countries and when we the vulnerability impact on the this the sector um, the, it is said that if there is nothing done, if nothing is done um, towards mitigating climate change, that cost could be real and as much as $22 um, billion in cost by 2050 or 10% of GDP. Uh, the hurricane season um, in, in 2017 cost the Caribbean maybe some $10 billion in, in losses to, to infrastructure. And of course, that is added on by the vulnerabilities worsened by the, um, the high levels of non-revenue water in our region. Next slide, please. So the, the water consumption, of course, in again, because we depend heavily on, on tourism and in, in the, the countries, of course, it, you know, the, to the tourism um, peak is usually coincides with our very, our dry season, as we say in the Caribbean, that's when we have less rainfall. And that is when there's the greatest pressure on, on um, our water facilities and sewage facilities, so that 
it is about 10 times more water consumption when we are at our peak tourism period. And then it's something that we have to juggle with um, in, in managing that situation. So on the one hand, we are faced with dealing with uh, the, the hurricane season. And on the other hand, when we have as many cruise ship arrivals and air arrivals and stay over tourists, we have to be able to produce the the amount of water to sustain um, those guests on on our islands, as well as um, the having sufficient water for domestic consumption. And so, we, again, with support from our other partners in the region, we have developed what we call the. Um, Regional Strategic Action Plan for Governance and Building Climate Resilience in the Water Sector in the Caribbean, RSAP as we call it. And that has been an initiative led by the two development banks in the region, the Caribbean Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Caribbean Water and Wastewater Association, as well as many partners. And the move is towards addressing a lot of these vulnerability issues and to help our utilities um, find <clears throat> with um, governance, um, with looking at building capacity and supporting um, the utilities and governments in trying to secure financing um, in various forms to be able to um, treat with the expansion. Oh, I, I should have asked you to change the next slide, my apologies. And one of the things that we have done by this, with, this slide, with this slide here now is to, uh, there has been tremendous work done towards forming the Caribbean Water Utilities Insurance Company. And it is, the intent is um, that we will be able to treat with, uh, or to have a facility um, to support utilities with early recovery um, assistance from participating utilities um, when they are impacted by, by disasters. Um, and the, the insurance will be a sort of mutual type insurance, which will be a vehicle with layers of coverage, including reinsurance, um, to effectively address substantial um, catastrophic losses. It will also help to finance investments in infrastructure resiliency improvements. And so that is the whole concept of setting up this um, uh, Caribbean Water Utilities Insurance. I think you reverted to the previous slide. If you, if you could come forward. Yeah, the quick. And so this is a work in progress and we hope that um, at some time this year that um, the authorities will get together and take it to the next level and we could maybe see it coming into fruition sometime in the year 2021. Um, the next slide, please, so that I can wrap up. Um, of course, one of the other things that we are embarking on in, in, in the region, uh, we're looking at alternatives and to help with building that type of resilience and more affordable, more climate friendly uh, types of infrastructure. Um, we are shortly will be embarking on a project, a pilot with the Water Office of Martinique and the International Water Office of France. They are embark considering a proposal to engage um, Wasco, the water and sewage company of St. Lucia, and the Wasco, the, the water and sewage company of Dominica, um, in building um, a, a pilot on um, constructed wetlands adapted to tropical conditions. So this is, again, uh, a work in progress in terms of a lot of the, the um, work that has taken place. And we hope that that should come off sometime in the next half of, well, in the second half of the year, we should get on the way with that pilot. Um, there has been previous work with um, 
with that technique, um, I think it, in a previous iteration of the crew, um, the Jeff Crew project, and uh, now we are in the Jeff Crew Plus. So, but I previously, I think in one of its first iterations, there was um, some work done with constructed wetlands, and we hope to continue that work and see our best, particularly in small coastal communities, how that can help to reduce the impact on the environment. So I think I have taken up more than my fair share of the time. I will end now and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ignatius. No problem at all. You have outlined um, with very good examples and uh, great visuals, really, uh, the vulnerability of uh, not just the infrastructure, but of the people and of the uh, service provision and catchment areas in the region. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. Um, we will have a quick break. I suggest we take uh, five minutes to have a sip of water and um, of course to fill in the satisfaction survey that we are going to share um, in the chat right now um, and then we will move on to a panel discussion. I look forward to it. So um, yeah, I'll see you all back in five minutes, which in my time zone is four 52. Thank you. Oh man, no, I saw my brother in law's uh, bill the other day. <laughs>
everyone. Um, I hope you all filled in the survey and uh, maybe if you have some questions, of course, we kindly invite you to post all the questions that you have into the chat box. And uh, before we enjoy the panel discussion, of course, we have uh, an input by Martin Karras. So without further ado, I would kindly ask Martin to join me on stage um, and present away. Yes, hi. Thank you very much, Alicia. I hope you all can hear me well. Um, I'm also working, as you already said, uh, I'm also working in the Rockland project uh, as Elaine. Um, waste, water and wastewater companies for climate mitigation. Uh, to remind everybody on the title, uh, but today it's not about the title, but about the content of our program. Um, and I want to I want to explain to you how in a program which has had climate mitigation, mitigation of greenhouse gases, uh, what challenges we encounter when we want to introduce climate risk management. That's my storyline. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide will show you a very, a very dense uh, overview of our program. I don't want to go into too much detail here. Um, important is when you look at the outcome level, it says water and wastewater utilities contribute to carbon neutral and climate resilient water sectors in our three partner countries, which are Jordan, Mexico and Peru. Um, and well, the climate resilient is, is the important uh, thing which I wanted to show you because that was that came with the current phase of our program. Um, the program started in 2013, so a couple of years ago, um, and it was uh, an original uh, program with the objective to reduce greenhouse gases in the urban water sector in our partner countries and beyond. And now in the current phase, um, we added this climate resilience uh, on top of that. Uh, maybe I can say something about the three components which you see down. Uh, there on the slide, uh, so A is about uh, working directly with utilities in the field and on the ground and uh, advising them on how to reduce greenhouse gases uh, and become more climate resilient. Uh, B is about um, while well, advising political partners on how to um, how to create the right political uh, conditions for uh, for climate action in the water sector and the urban water sector. And C is about multiplication, um, meaning that uh, we share share experiences uh, among our countries and also beyond the countries, uh, just as we do today. OK, next slide, please. You will see that climate resilient becomes circled, but yes. Um, before I, I talk about climate resilience uh, in our project, I first want to emphasize once again the relevance of uh, reducing greenhouse gases in the urban water sector. Um, I think when you when you take a look at uh, at water programs uh, from development institutions um, and they have to do with climate change, then the vast majority will be about climate resilience and adaptation to climate change. And there only, there's only a minority dealing with uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the urban water sector. Um, but I think it's relevant. Uh, if you go further in the slide, um, we see that exactly, um, well, water and wastewater utilities are usually among the, the biggest uh, users of, of electricity in a municipality. Uh, and uh, it depends on the source of electricity and the kind of electricity. But if they use fossil fuels, um, of course, it means that they also produce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the next image will show you uh, something about uh, nitrous oxide, oxide and methane, which are two greenhouse gases which are much more potent uh, than, than carbon. Um, I think nitrous oxide is about 300 times as, as damaging to the, to the climate as carbon, at least if you take it in a 100 years time span. I must be careful to not to speak too quick, I guess, because of the translation. Um, yeah, so wastewater is another um, contributor to greenhouse gases. So you see it's it's a relevant issue. Um, the water sector really does uh, contribution to, to climate change through greenhouse gases. Um, the next uh, small uh, picture will show us the good thing um, 
uh, because action is being done uh, by us and by other actors and uh, through the countries themselves first and foremost. Um, for instance, we, we helped countries with advising and uh, uh, then something happens like replacing uh, inefficient pumps, so the new pumps use, use much less energy or countries uh, extend uh, or cities extend their wastewater uh, sewer rich uh, system so that more wastewater gets collected and treated. Uh, so good things are happening and uh, the last uh, small uh, picture will show you um, well that also uh, utilities are using uh, tools to to assess and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. If you go to the next slide, uh, I want to quickly introduce you to our signature tool. Next, yes, exactly. Thank you. Uh, which is the ECAM tool. Um, ECAM stands for Energy Performance and Carbon Emissions Assessment and Monitoring Tool. There is an official Spanish uh, translation of that, but I'm not aware of it right now. Um, just, but, but you don't have to re remember the full name, you just have to remember ECOM. Um, and while it helps utilities to, um, to assess where they, they produce greenhouse gases, uh, where they could save greenhouse gases and how to report them, um, because we want uh, the water sector to, to be part of, of the national climate policies and we want the greenhouse gas which come from the water sector also acknowledged uh, as part of the national greenhouse gas inventory. All right, so that's that's enough on mitigation. I hope you are convinced now that it's an important uh, topic also for the urban water sector. Uh, and now on the next slide, I will uh, explain our experience in introducing climate risk management in a project which has focused on mitigation of greenhouse gases for so long. Um, uh, I just got the official <laughs> translation in Spanish, but I, I think I won't mention it now. Um, so we want uh, we have can't, uh, we have utilities uh, with developing climate risk plans. Um, the our partner utilities are some of them are I would say medium sized. Um, well, and so our approach to climate risk management is to develop uh, a, an approach uh, which might be uh, suited to each individual utility uh, and which is not too much effort, so which they could also do without uh, external consultants and which is re replicable. Um, in Peru, we have a situation that um, that there is already a structure in place. Um, urban water utilities and wastewater utilities in Peru do climate mitigation and adaptation plans uh, each five years. Uh, so we, we advise them during that process together with our partner project in Peru, Pro Agua Dos. Um, and uh, while in Mexico and Jordan, there are also there are also legislations um, on the ground which uh, which help to motivate uh, uh, the utility staff. Um, so when we when we came to Mexico and and uh, to our partner utility, which is located in the state of Leon, um, one of the reactions was: so is it is it required by our municipality? That's why I say that the uh, the political conditions are very important. Um, uh, because it, it shouldn't be just external people uh, suggesting to, to assess climate risks, but it's, it's of course, uh, another, um, another success factor if it's required by the national, regional and maybe local legislation. Um, and yeah, we learned the same with mitigation. It's important to have the utility ownership. So the manager of the utility should be convinced that uh, it makes it, it it has a lot of benefits to do climate risk management, such as uh, greenhouse gas mitigation. Um, but not only the manager, but also people who are working in the utility and uh, the person who will help us with doing the climate risk plan. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so I think I will be a bit quick on that slide. Um, I took this uh, arrow from a World Bank publication uh, on the resilience of water and uh, and sanitation utilities. Um, and I, I think they, they basically also follow the decision tree framework, which Alex mentioned before. 
Um, if you click on next, uh, I, I will show so you see here the, the whole water system from the tap to the disposal. Um, and just as an example, if we uh, if there if climate change means that there will be more heat waves and more water scarcity, the the impacts you see below, they are just examples of what could happen. I don't say this will happen if there is more intense heat and more water scarcity. Um, we need to assess very carefully and thoroughly um, how the impact might be. Sometimes we, we actually don't even know because uh, uh, models are not secure if it will rain more or rain less and then maybe we have we don't uh, know the exact state of the infrastructure. Uh, so it's not as easy as shown on, on this slide. Um, for example, I will only um, give as an, as an example the sewage um, step, um, where the example is increasing wastewater quantity as, an, as a result of increasing uh, water scarcity and heat which means there is more demand for fresh water, which then might also result in more wastewater being produced, uh, which might overload uh, the sewer system and maybe also then the, the treatment system. Uh, but it can also be the opposite effect. So it can also, uh, water scarcity can also lead to less water being available, uh, water savings, water conservation, um, um, efforts, uh, which means that, that there will be less wastewater quantity available, uh, higher turbidity, as we learned from uh, Ignatius also. Um, so this will be a very different challenge. Um, so just to show you, it's important to to take a careful look on, on the exact impacts. And I think the next slide is my last slide. Um, so as I said, uh, we just started with climate risk management in the current phase. Uh, we are now starting to help um, and to advise uh, our partner utilities in how to uh, how to set up such a such a risk management plan. Um, we compared a lot of methodologies, uh, like the World Bank one I just mentioned, of course, also CRIDA, which was presented uh, by Alex in the in the beginning. Um, we found that some of them require a very strong effort uh, and uh, a lot of financial resources. Um, that's why we we try combining elements from them uh, and yeah, making them usable in a state where the water utility has little knowledge about uh, uh, about maybe the state of resources and other factors, and also um, when the impacts of climate change might be unclear. Uh, just to go through it, the first step is to be aware of the system, um, to know, maybe not to know every screw, but uh, to know the pumps and the pipes and and the water resource. So it might be groundwater aquifer uh, and the state of it. Um, the um, people should also be aware of the vulnerability of these specific elements. Uh, so which which part of the system is particularly critical, which maybe has failed in the past and might fail again. Then next step would be to take a look at future climate scenarios. Um, we advocate for not uh, for not downscaling uh, a global scenario if it doesn't help you with uh, with the uncertainty, but to take what to 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 take it from existing sources only. Uh, because it's much cheaper and much quicker. Uh, well, and then just analyze the um, the vulnerability of the elements under each uh, of the of the scenarios, and in the end, uh, identify adaptation measures, um, prioritize them through, for example, through a multi-criteria analysis or a cost-effectiveness analysis. Uh, but also, that's very important through participatory approaches. So they should be shared with stakeholders, which pe with people who work in the utility, um, just to to be aware what might be the best option um, for the utility. All right, thank you. That's it. All right, thank you so much, uh, Martin. We will never forget ACAM tool, of course. Um, and I must uh, ask you to kindly just stay wherever you where you are. And um, I will invite Alex and Ignatius to turn on their cameras as well, so we can engage in a panel discussion. 
and I will start with um, a question to you, Martin, just waiting for the others to join. I hope it works with a camera now, Ignatius. If not, it's no biggie. Coming on. Okay. I, I, it's not coming on at all. So I, I, don't, I don't know why. I don't know why this is so. Okay. Um, no problem. So we can probably have this. to give me permission to do that. Okay. Um, I don't know because I didn't create the event. So um, okay, the yeah. creator is Tizian. Maybe if, so uh, probably it's probably not allowing guests to turn on the video. I think that's a problem mm -hmm. because I'm yeah, sorry. Okay. We'll take not note of this technical problem not, not and a, not a problem. Keep it in mind for future webinars. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but we can hear you. This is the most important thing. Um, so I will just have a uh, first question to Martin. Uh, you have just shared with us the success factors required for an effective climate risk management, uh, which include, uh, as you mentioned, legislation and ownership. So what actions or reaction would you like to see being taken um, at policy level, especially uh, in light of uh, like uh, climate induced disasters happening more and more often um, to support urban water management better? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think that maybe the single most important action is at the national level um, for, um, for creating the right political conditions um, and it's yeah, I, I saw in many countries that there is a challenge of the water people in the ministry, which is responsible for water management, to talk to the ministry, which is responsible for climate change policy, uh, which is most of the case, um, the Ministry of Environment. Um, and it sometimes happens that water people have great ideas, uh, but they don't get them through because they didn't talk to the climate change people. Um, for example, when uh, when there's a proposal for climate funding, they usually need at least a letter of, of consent from the Ministry of Environment. Uh, so I would say the, the most effective uh, single action is uh, that water people and climate people and maybe also disaster risk management people uh, join forces. Okay, thank you so much. So. Um... Here's a statement to break the silos. Uh, thank you very much. I have a next up question to Alex. Um, in your presentation, you outlined the five steps of a climate risk informed decision analysis, this FRIDA. Um, how do you get the target groups, whoever they may be, uh, hooked on operationalizing resilience what are your main arguments for convincing decision makers to apply climate risk analysis? Good question. Um, well, I guess to start, maybe this part doesn't take a lot of convincing, but for, for all, pretty much all water managers, climate change will impact their work at some point. So it might be a big worry of theirs or might be a smaller one in the back of their mind. They think they can deal with it later. But the main push would be just to really start systematically doing some sort of climate risk assessment, whether it's CRIDA or otherwise. Um, Martin presented a, a great set of steps for climate risk management for utilities, and it was spot on. Um, but again, a lot of these decisions have really long-lived consequences. So it comes down to doing adequate planning ahead of time, because once the concrete is poured, you're really locked in to a, a, to a, a particular system. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're doing something that's efficient uh, across a range of climate futures, um, something that uh, can be cost effective so that you're not ending up with something like stranded assets uh, and, you know, a piece of infrastructure that doesn't work in 10 years because the climate shifted so dramatically um, and it's not functioning before it's even before it's designed operational lifetime. Um, yeah, CRIT is one of a number of tools for assessing risk. Uh, it's It's been demonstrated um, and institutionalized successfully in a lot of different contexts from, again, the U.S. state of California has um, made it part of its state water management plan. Uh, the U.N. Economic Commission for Europe has uh, written it into part of its um, next three-year plan as well. So there's 
demonstrated uh, success already. And then maybe to close with too, that this is, this is a really um, inclusive tool that brings stakeholders in from the outset so that uh, for like a wastewater utility, if you're consulting with your customers or people who are within your system, um, that if they're involved in the decision-making process, then they're buying for your decisions even sometimes if it might include like a small rate hike or otherwise, um, they might they might have less pushback uh, if they're involved in the decision-making process. So um, try not to be, you know, unilateral and try to be more inclusive with, uh, with your climate risk assessments too. All right, thank you very much. Um, Ignatius, so our IT support said that uh, you might try to turn on your camera now because uh, it should, work well i'm so, trying on but i don't know something is not happening for me my apologies is okay i'm no clicking on to it it's just not working so i okay, find no that worries. passing strange sorry uh, we have here a great question um from the audience from kevin carter um so uh basically he is asking um saying that Chris Corbin from UN Environment brought up the idea of reclaimed water uh, being implemented in the Caribbean. What the panelists think about the feasibility of using reclaimed water to assist drought resiliency, more especially as new wastewater treatment plants and systems are constructed? So um, I don't know who wants to take this question first. Maybe um, Ignatius, if you want to. Yeah, well, um, yeah, thanks um, to Chris and, and Kevin for this. I know Chris is a big advocate for saying to us that there is only one water and we, we got to see wastewater. Um, I think it's a question of trying to rebrand it as maybe the new water or, or find some other name than wastewater. And I think that is the, the first job, I think, is to be able to work on the minds of people uh, when we speak of um, reuse of wastewater. Um, there, there are lots of opportunities. Um, I think some there are small initiatives that are ongoing in terms of uh, using um, water, treated wastewater for irrigation um, on some of the hotel plants for, for, their, for the gardens and lawns, etc. Um, there have been some concepts of using um, some of that treated wastewater um, in the agricultural sector as well, um, but it would mean the collaboration with the, the various governments towards the trucking of water from maybe the treatment plants, particularly when we have the, the dry season and we suffer severe droughts where that can be used for irrigation in the first instance. But I think um, as some other um, jurisdictions um, in other places have gone, the, I think in Singapore, where they actually totally make use of um, wastewater for uh, human consumption. So I think the technology um, is around and is I think it's coming around so that it may be possible in the not too distant future to begin to think in that direction um, because of the, the, the additional cost on the environment, the environmental impact of not doing anything about um, the wastewater that we generate. And the, also our um, increased water scarcity in, in our region. Okay, thank you very much. I like what you said in the beginning, there is only one water. Um, maybe Alex or Martin, do you like to add anything to what Ignatius said? Sure, I can just jump in quickly. Um, I was also going to piggyback on the that concept of one water really makes a lot of sense that, you know, we're looking at one, one water system and so we could be talking about the particular wastewater facility, but it's really just as important to look at the different inputs that are going into that. So. Um, if you can come up with ways to to reduce the water that needs to be treated, um, whether that's through offset of, of you know using reclaimed water for things like irrigation or use of of gray water, um, or even things like rainwater harvesting, so that you you know you need to turn on the tap less often. Um, that 
you can do that in such a way that it will um, reduce the load of these wastewater facilities because they're not energy neutral either. So any anything that you can do to increase their efficacy or reduce the load that they have to treat um, would be, I think, a net benefit in the long run. And especially as we're thinking about situations of increasing water scarcity to um, that this is yeah, a, a good option to consider. Exactly, yeah, I, I also agree. And uh, you don't need to to invest on on such uh, expensive things as desalination um, if you if you have the other options first and, and use all the efficiency. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so Martin, I have another question for you because you just mentioned desalination. I was thinking of, okay, we know that for instance in Israel, I think desalination is um, quite uh, big and different countries use different technologies uh, to uh, handle water scarcity. Um, your program or the program you work with um, works in Jordan, Mexico and Peru. Again, very different countries. So. Um, different countries also facing different levels of climate risk um, and different levels of resource availability, right? So how do you at Vaclim um, manage the replicability of solutions um, and concepts? And do you find it easy to transfer these from country to country? Um, yeah, that's a very, very interesting uh, and challenging question, um, but that's always good. <laughs> Um, I think when we when it comes to climate resilience, the challenges are not that different in the three countries. Uh, all three have, especially Jordan, uh, suffers from from water scarcity, but also parts of Mexico are very very uh, dry, uh, and even even Peru has uh, these issues. Um, and also solutions are. Um, similar, for example, wastewater reuse, which was just discussed by us. Um, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's a solution in all three countries, uh, and it's it's a political thing in all three countries. Uh, so I think we um, there is there is a lot of similarity. Um, the capacities are very different, uh, not only or not not necessarily in the countries or between the countries. Um, I don't know who we see here. Is this uh, our speaker? <laughs> <laughs> um, great, uh, so it works now. Um, but uh, also within the countries, um, the capacities are, are very different depending if you're in the capital or uh, in the field. Um, the, I think there are some places which never heard about climate risk management um, and, and a place which are much more advanced on, on that issue. And when we come and want to advice on that topic, uh, they, they might be already bored. Um, so there's a, there's a big difference on that. Uh, well, and we try, as I said, we try to use the same base methodology for all cases, but it needs to be adapted to the local context always. It doesn't make sense if we don't uh, the, the local uh, expertise. Uh, so it will always be a bit specific. Maybe one very quick thing about mitigation, uh, because that's really different um, in, in the three countries um, or in the locations where we work in the three countries, uh, because uh, in, in countries which use a lot of uh, fossil fuels, um, even if you exchange pumps, then you can, can save a huge amount of greenhouse gases and of electricity because they are just more efficient. Um, but countries like Peru, where in some regions, uh, the use is, is uh, hydropower um, and also uh, gravity is much more important for the flow of water. Uh, electricity is just not that that big of a factor for, for greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions. So that's why in Peru, uh, one of our fo focus focuses is on, on uh, uh, low greenhouse gas uh, wastewater management. So just to, to say there is, there is, I think there is more um, diversity in on mitigation than on adaptation in our countries. Great takeaway. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Martin. I think um, we are finally coming uh, slowly but steadily to an end um, in this webinar. I just have maybe one last question to Ignatius because we can finally see you. Uh, well <laughs> done. <laughs> um, so uh, where was my question? Yeah, something that interests me specifically. You mentioned in one of your last slides um, 
this constructed wetland that uh, has been adapted to tropical conditions um, in terms of technicalities that have been used. Um, so what about the adaptation of technical capacities of human resources working in the sector? Are utilities, uh, for instance, being trained and prepared to adapt infrastructure and service provision to, for instance, climate induced uh, disasters? Is this something that people are being trained on? Wait, you are muted. Yeah, my apologies. Thank yes, you. indeed. Um, thank you. Uh, this is would be one of the functions of the institution that I represent, Kawasa, uh, that we are would be responsible for supporting our utilities with the type of training, the requisite training in that regard. We have as a as an organization and with our other partners in the region um, done considerable work with trying to um, help our utilities and first as i said it is a, about a change of the mindset and educating people about the options that we have and i think the work of un caribbean and um, like the likes of uh, mr chris corbin and others um, have done in the previous crew um, iterations have had considerable work in, in the concept of wastewater and managing wastewater in, in our region. The other step that we are doing as Kawasa um, is, as I mentioned, this um, partnership that we uh, will be embarking on very shortly um, once the, the um, French officials, our colleagues in Martinique and, and in France have approval with an EU project, a pilot project that will um, be undertaken in Dominica and St. Lucia very shortly, um, hopefully um, in the next um, few months uh, once there is approval. So that is part of the, 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 the process of beginning to or continuation of the training programs for our utilities and the operators, the teams in the utilities to be cognizant of these options and to learn some of the techniques. Um, that is already happening. I know I'm advised that there is a small one of the hotel plants, a small hotel plant that has such a facility and we are to visit that sometime soon. And in Mart neighboring Martinique, um, the French island, and of course that's why we need to have those linkages around our region across the language barriers to be able to share knowledge and um, new techno and emerging technologies to help us to um, work better with our environment in the region. So certainly this is an area that we have on the cards. Great, thank you so much. Um, buzzword sharing knowledge, which um, is what we aim to do with our webinars. Uh, so I think this is a great ending note. Thank you so much to all of you for joining, for participating and listening. And again, special thanks to our speakers. Maybe Elaine, you can turn on your camera um, to wave <laughs> to the audience. Um, if you're still there, that would be great. And um, stay tuned, everyone, for more webinars brought to you by the Crew Plus Academy. And um, hopefully the Academy will welcome our speakers of today in another webinar again. Thank you so much. And Thank the recordings you. will be made available on YouTube. We will be all famous and uh, the presentations will be shared on our website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. And well done, Crew Academy. <laughs> Thank you.